The Nutcracker's Sweet, An Ever After Mystery, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 23 Clarice froze on the last rung of the fire escape. Somewhere near the gate, a man moved. Should she go back up and warn Milo, or would it be better to run for help? Help, she decided. She couldn't do anything, and getting herself killed wouldn't save Milo. But if he could evade them long enough, definitely. She dropped the last couple of feet when she heard the footsteps running to the door. A peer around the corner showed the door sliding shut again. Clarice ran. She'd made it halfway down the block before she heard it. Was that gunfire? She ran faster. At the drugstore two blocks over, she found the owner locking up. I need the police. Can you call the police? Meyer's factory. Hurry. The man just blinked at her. Clarice didn't have time for this. She dashed around the counter and lunged for the telephone hanging on the wall. The operator promised to send the police immediately. After half a second of consideration, she asked to be put through to Doyle's station. Over by the Chesterfield. On Grant? The man at the desk promised to let Lombardi know she'd called. No, I need to talk to Detective Doyle. It's an emergency. Well, he's not here, is he? So you just go on home and Lombardi will get to you when he has time. I'll bet he will. Never mind. I'll find Doyle myself. Lily Barnes knows how to get a hold of him. A roar of protest followed, but Clarice just replaced the receiver and promised the shopkeeper that she'd return the next day with a nickel for the calls. Outside the store, she hesitated. Should she call Holmes? Instinct told her she should, but the door locked behind her. After banging a couple of times, she gave up and took to the street at a run. She'd find somewhere else. She needed Holmes. That thought brought her up short. Holmes. He knew she was there all alone. Did he send Milo? Or the other man? And the man on the stairs? Could it have been Holmes? Her mouth went dry as pieces fit together. Clarice shook herself. No. Holmes had saved her from Topo's men. Why? This time, the dry mouth caused her to choke. If he worked for Soleri, then those men had come. Would he have protected her then? Was the man Milo had attacked sent by the rival gang? That's what they were, wasn't it? A gang? Sent by Holmes? She couldn't remember any more. With no money for a taxi, Clarice kept walking until she found an office with a light on. Babcock's Limited. A car roared up the street as she began knocking. The squeal of tires stopped her. She glanced over her shoulder and then stared as the car reversed and shot back toward her. The door swung open, and Detective Lombardi called to her. Get in. I... No, Miss Stoll, there's a report of gunshots at your factory. Of course there is. I made the report. The man probably had a gun. What bull didn't? Clarice slid into the seat next to the detective and pulled the door shut. What should she say? Her head buzzed until sense became more than unlikely. It was now an impossibility. Where's Natali, Miss Stahl? I don't know. That was the truth, but the detective's growl told her it wouldn't be sufficient. He helped me get out of the factory when we heard someone coming in. Then I heard gunshots as I was running away to get help. I went to that drugstore. She pointed as they drove past the now darkened store and Lombardi huffed. Um, and well, I called your station. And asked for Doyle. He shot her a glare. Not kosher, Miss Stahl. She tried to distract him by playing the dumb Dora. I've spoken more with him. It was only natural to think of his name first. Lombardi shot her a look, and after turning the corner onto the street leading to the factory seemed to relax. Yeah, well. A single light shone in the office upstairs. Had it been on the whole time? 
or had Milo gone up there? As Lombardi ordered her from the car, swearing about something she couldn't understand, and urged her inside, he said, Show me. Show you what? Where you were when you heard someone come in. Who was it? I didn't recognize him. Actually, I didn't see him. Milo pushed me out of the room when he went to attack the man. I got out, and when I went for help, I heard the gunshots. Her throat constricted. He could be dead. Let's hope. After half a second, he added, Not. Had he swallowed hard at the thought of someone dying or tried to hide his true feelings? Clarice couldn't decide. Just inside the door, as Lombardi threw the enormous switch that lit the whole factory floor, Clarice saw it, a spot of blood. Several feet away, she saw another, and another. Someone's bleeding. With gunshots? Of course, you dimwit. What do you expect? I expect an officer to treat ladies with respect. Citizens with respect, in fact. Perhaps Bull is a better name for men like you after all. Come on, show me. The closer they drew to the painter's corner, the more blood they found. Either whoever was injured stopped bleeding, or they'd managed to staunch it better the closer they'd gotten to the door. She rounded the corner and turned away at the sight of a man crumpled on the floor. A whimper escaped before she could steady herself enough to ask, I Is it Milo? Romano, one of Solari's men. This'll be war. A few more expletives echoed through the building. The man's hand clapped around her arm and held it in a grip sure to bruise. Where's Natali? I don't know. I told you. I left. Out the front? Clarice shook. Her hands, shoulders, lips, even her eyelids shook as tears coursed down her face. She couldn't lie. Somehow he'd know, but she didn't want to remind him about the fire escape. She might need it. Lombardi jerked her back and forth until her teeth rattled. Which way did you go? Upstairs. That's when she realized the light the office had been on as she'd rushed past. How do you? He froze, considered something, and pushed her. Go on, show me. Though she tried to wrench away, he still held her arm fast. Please, you're hurting me. This sort of brutality won't go over well with Chief Thomas. You won't be talking to him. Now move. Twice, she slipped as she dashed up the stairs. The detective was right on her heels, ready to shove her upward with his foot to her posterior if that's what it took. She knew because he did. Ouch! Move! That's when she heard it. The odd, ooh, of the cranked sirens the police sometimes used. Her mind insisted she knew what it meant, but she couldn't make it unlock that door of information. Detective Lombardi shoved her into the office. Okay, now, how did you get out? Her eyes focused on the bowl of peppermints as some kind of anchor. Metal. Thin. Brass? Perhaps. Not well polished, if so. Pewter. That was it. Not golden enough for brass or bronze. The man poked her again and asked where. Not here she whispered. Those peppermints. Where? At the end of the walkway. Had she answered, or had someone else? Lombardi pulled a sheet of paper from the typewriter and grabbed a pencil from the desk pad. Write. Write what? Write. I killed Dietrich Meyer. I'm sorry, and sign your name. Shocked out of her stupor, Clarice refused to take the pencil. But I didn't. Perhaps her subconscious expected it. Maybe she'd been as shocked as she could be by that point. She didn't know. But when the detective pulled out his gun and ordered her to write that note again, Clarice wasn't surprised, and she refused. Shoot me, then. 
but I'm not going to confess to a crime I didn't do. The sirens were louder now. So just shoot me. I sound brave enough, but am I? Then again, if I wrote it, what would he do with it? Lombardi grabbed her with his free hand and shoved her out the door and down the walkway. The barrel of the gun pressed against her neck as he asked, So, how'd you get out of here? The fire escape, right? Where is it? The door, at the end. Time swirled in a cyclone of thoughts, actions, sights, and sounds. One moment she'd been shoved into the dark walkway, the next she was out on the fire escape. Jump. Clarice turned to stare at the man. The sirens had almost reached them. What? Jump. Mind racing, she remembered that first night. If she touched the escape railing, she'd hold on tight. Would he smash her hand and make her let go and push her off? Shoot her? Would she survive a fall like that? The equivalent of three stories, really. People had survived that much, hadn't they? She'd nearly fallen that night. No. Still facing him, she took one step back, then another. Odd, he wasn't moving forward. When she didn't take another step, his pistol raised. There couldn't be much more room. If she weren't careful, she'd fall. Just another step and it'll all be over. Go on, hurry up now. They're turning into the yard. They'll see. This is perfect. Now. When the gun raised again, Clarice realized he wouldn't shoot. He'd throw. She took a big step back and felt herself falling. All the fuzziness fled as she dropped. Clarice grabbed for the rungs. Her fingers flapped against a few, but she managed to grip one. Pain ripped through her right shoulder, and she let go, but the other hand gripped onto the next rung. That hurt as well, but not nearly as much. Her right arm hung useless. She couldn't work her way down, not when her arm wouldn't reach for the rung. Dangling there, her hand cold and losing its grip, she realized she'd never hang on long enough. Lord, help me. Maybe he shouldn't. Had she asked him about her decision to stay late? Had she asked him what to do about the business, about Mr. Topo, and about the little puzzle pieces that now made a fairly clear picture? A shout below her demanded she hang on. Her hand slipped more. Clarice shuddered as she realized it was a matter of a few seconds before she fell. Several men stood down there and one began to climb. Another. Her hand slipped. She managed to grip three or four rungs down and to kick the man climbing to reach her. That hand started to slip almost immediately and her arm burned with the pain of it. At least I'm not kicking and thrashing. That has to help. I have some self-possession left anyway. Step onto the rung. Her mind fumbled with those words. Step? A hand gripped her foot and set it on one of the rungs. It repeated it with the other foot. What an idiot. Why didn't I stand on the rungs? She slipped her arm over the rung and allowed her armpit to help hold her steady. The officer climbed up beside her and touched her bad arm. Clarice screamed. I'm not going to hurt you. You just did. I grabbed with that arm going down. Tears coursed down her cheeks. Do you have to be so dramatic? It just really hurts, and I can't move it. Dislocated, most likely. The doctor will fix you up. The officer grinned at her. Strange place to meet a pretty girl, but I'll take it. James Mallory at your service, miss. Detective Lombardi, he's in there. He made me jump. The man's expression could mean anything, Clarice prayed she hadn't just sealed her fate. Then, even in the semi-darkness, she saw his jaw twitch and he called down. Lombardi's the double-crosser. He's in the factory. Head swimming, Clarice decided she should thank him. Instead, she said, I think I should sit down. 
the man grabbed her about the waist and held fast. Oh, no, you don't. And no slapping me for getting fresh. I'm just trying to keep you from spending Christmas in the hospital. A black fog filled her, but one more thought emerged. Is this where I say the bank's closed? The last thing she heard was laughter. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.